Thomas, good morning. Tyler. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining, dude. Uh, I'm so Man. excited to have you as a guest on the Impact Driven Leader podcast. Uh, we've gotten to know each other over the last couple of months. I've gotten to know you uh, pretty intimately. We've shared a lot of time together. We've done an event together, which is we're going to talk about that today, the leadership event that uh, we, we were able to put on. But I'd love for you to do this is to, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about you in the intro that you haven't heard yet, but uh, I would love for you to just kind of introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, who is Thomas Williams? Oh, man, Tyler, it's awesome to, to be here, man. You know, it's, it's crazy. I feel like over the pandemic, we've, we've met people that we would have maybe never even met if the world was opened up. And so you and I have met and never met at the same time, uh -huh. which is, which is so cool. But we've had these, these long in-depth conversations, uh, into your audience. Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Williams. I am a dad. Uh, I'm a subpar, sub, sub, subpar golfer. Um, I'm a, I'm an okay cook. Um, and I'm just a me. I tell people all the time. I'm a professional me originally from okay. a small town in Northern California called Vacaville, uh, which is right between Sacramento and San Francisco. Um, and I'm from there so I can kind of talk about it a little bit in the way that I am is like, you would, you wouldn't really necessarily know about it unless you were literally driving from SAC to San Fran or, or vice versa. And you were stopping to get, uh, a burger from in and out or fill up your gas tank. So uh, from there, I, I earned a scholarship and came to USC where we played in 50 or 65 games. We lost five, uh, won 59, and that was from 2003 to 2007. Got drafted to the NFL in 2008, played from 2008 until 2012. I had a career-ending neck injury. And after that, I think like a lot of 18 to 25 year olds, you want to figure out where's your place in this world. And so I decided to, or I should say it was decided for me with my purpose of you're going to be transitioning from a game changer to a life changer. And mm. so I transitioned from making plays on the field to making a difference in people's lives. And so 2012 till now, here we are in 2022. Um, I am an author, a speaker, a facilitator, um, a speaker and a member of the John Gordon speaking team, um, and a consultant. I've done some adjunct professor work in the past with athletes, helping them transition into college on a, on a life skills, uh, focus and intentional. And other than that, man, I'm, uh, I'm a guy trying to figure it out. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate that. That was a great rundown. I have been to Vacaville, um, having lived in <laughs> California for a few years. Um, and you, I mean, you kind of described it how it is. That's fine. That's cool. I mean, <laughs> each is to their own there. I mean, I can tell you about growing up in Northeast Ohio, and it, it's not going to be as descriptive as that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, hear about those map dot towns. That's where I grew up and yeah. you know, ran on a farm in the middle of, like I said, Northeast Ohio. But, um, Part of, you know, we were introduced, we've, we've built this relationship, we had the opportunity, and, and partly what, you know, I'm excited to talk about here is we had the opportunity to do a leadership, a, a virtual leadership conference for a, uh, a chapter of HDI, uh, Help Desk International. And one of the things that you just touched on there, you talked about your USC record. And your coach when you were at USC was the uh, infamous, the famed Pete Carroll. And uh, as we started off that conference, you shared a story about Pete. And I'd love for you to share that story and kind of kick off there. Um, and I'm going to tee it up this way. It is one of the things that we discussed in, in, in talking about leadership is sometimes people enter into a position of leadership and others don't want them there. And so let me kick it off that way, and, and I'd love for you to talk about your experience going to USC and uh, your first experience with Pete. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's great because we can look back and say, oh, it worked out, and, and here's the aha in the, you know, what is it, 18 years, 20, I think it's 20 years, 20, 21 years now. Um, but I mean, it, it, just like you described it. How awful would it be to be given the keys to, uh, you know, an organization or a department or a team and no one wants you there, especially the higher ups. And so that kind of was a little bit of the story at USC when Pete Carroll came there from the NFL. He had, you know, kind of toured the NFL, a couple of different teams and organizations. 
and the knock on him at the time was he's too much of a player's coach, right? So he's he's too much love, not enough accountability, uh, not enough structure, not enough you know philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so he lands at USC, and it wasn't by everyone's favorite decision. I think it was something that Mike Garrett saw in him, the president at the time, who also saw something in him and said, hey, we need some new juice. And so – you, Pete Carroll gets there, and, and in the off season, if you know about football, you really have a, a quick turnaround from the end of last season to the beginning of the next season because there's recruiting, there's off season training. You got to put your 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 roster and your and your team together. On top of that, he had to find his coaches and his new coaching staff and his own philosophy. And so he said, "How am I going to get this team to play as a team quickly?" And so one day during training camp, instead of going to the to the football field and practicing, you know, 11 versus 11, he uh, invited the whole entire team from campus over to the Coliseum, which is where USC plays. And in the middle of the field, he had this tarp. And so he said, um, somebody pulled the tarp off. And so it was just this big old giant rope. And he said, I want offense to pull five players on this side, defense pull five players and put them on that side, pick it up. And when I blow the whistle, I want you guys to pull. So they're pulling back and forth. And so finally, the offense wins because they're playing tug of war. And so the offense wins. And so they're hyped. They're pumped up. They're high-fiving each other. And the defense is mad and angry, as you could expect any competitive individual or group to be. And uh, defense says, no, coach, we're going to do it again. So Coach Carroll goes, great, do it again. So now they start pulling back and forth again, and the defense wins. So now the offense is pissed off and upset. And defense is high five and says, so coach says, great, we're going to be a 50-50 team. This is going to be a, a defense and an offensive team. And everyone's like, no way. This is either or, right, because we're competitive. So then the offense wins. And so he says, I guess it's going to be an offensive team on the third time. And the defense was like, heck no, coach. He said, Coach Carroll says, well, how about this? Defense, Take your five guys who are on the opposing side from the offense, and you guys go stand on the same side as the offense. Now there's 10 people on the same side um, holding the rope. And he says, now pull. Now all 10 people pull. And they're looking around at each other, and they're looking at, at Coach Carroll and the rest of the coach, and they go, what do you mean? He goes, how was it? They go, it was easy. He goes, of course it was, because everybody pulled together in the same direction at the same exact time. He said, from here on out, we're going to pull in the same direction at the same time. He says, whether we're at home, whether we're away, whether we're at practice, whether we're in, in the cafeteria, whether we're in class or out and about, we're always going to pull in the same direction at the same time with all of our force and all of our might. And the thing that he taught us that day, Tyler, is that it doesn't matter about who's against you, who's for you, as long as you're pulling in the same direction at the same time. Everybody given everything that they have, you're our team. You're united. Mm -hmm. um, and also what he sparked in us that day is that it's going to be a competitive culture. The philosophy is going to be compete. Compete in everything that you do. It doesn't matter if you're playing rock, paper, scissors. It doesn't matter if you're competing on studying for a test or getting ready for your next opponent. If you can compete, you give yourself that much more of a chance to win. So let's take in, you know, there's, there's so many great leadership lessons in and of that from, you know, how Pete approached you guys to, you know, you guys interacting with each other, but let's look at this way. You know, if someone's listening today and, and they're leader in an organization, they work in an organization and, and maybe they're in the same place as Pete to where they can, you know, call different groups together and, and go through that exercise, or maybe they're a, a offensive lineman maybe they're a defensive back where they're just a player on the team where do you as you envision that back and as you try to communicate that to people in our world today let's yeah. say we're you know we're recording on the last day of 2021 we're excited about to get into 2022 how do you see that same thing playing out as you look at organizations in the world today and, and how can people use that to say okay we can use this as this ideology as a tool to help within our own organization? Yeah, it's such a great question. And and that's what I love about what I get a chance to do is that I get a chance to take the lessons that I learned through sports and in football and apply it to corporate, whether it's, uh, you know, C-level or whether it's the managers or supervisors or whatever it is. And I think the best thing that I've found out through my experience with working with people is that asking the leader the question, who are you? 
Pete knows who he is. One of the things that he had a difficult time, and he, he would even admit this through his books and through his podcasts, is that he wasn't necessarily always knowing who he was. And so when he came to USC, he knew exactly who he was. And still to this day, when he's with Seattle, he knows who he is. If you listen to anything, it will always be about competition. Now, it's not now what I think he did in that day and then what these leaders can do in, in today's society is that you don't get competition. Uh, for him, it was competition. He's not trying to get his players to go against each other. He's just trying to create an environment and a culture full of competition. And so first and foremost, a leader has to know who they are. You know, there's I feel like we're in a regurgitation phase of, of, of life where everybody wants to like, I'm going to come to Tyler's house or Tyler's business. And I'm going to take something from him and I'm going to apply it to my culture. Well, that's not who I am because who I am is I'm, I'm energetic. I'm passionate. I'm believing the things that, that are not as though they were like that's to my core. That's who I am. But if I try to do something completely different and off and I try to lead from Tyler's lens, then I'm not going to necessarily be a hundred percent authentic and organic, and we're not going to maximize who we are. So first and foremost, who are you as a leader? And make sure inside of your culture, inside of your company, that resonates and comes through. It's like the old, uh, the old adage, you know, take a, take a napkin and, and write down three things that you, or who you are, who you represent, like part of your identity, right? Like I'm funny, I'm smart, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm humble or whatever it is. And then you ask the five closest people to you on the back of that napkin to write down three words that represent who you are. And are those words the same as the words you wrote down. And mm -hmm. if they are great, then that means that you're being transparent with who you are and who you want others to receive you as. Um, but most of the time it's not that way. And so what leaders need to do is make sure that who they are is, is bleeding through their organization is, yeah, I mean, it's just overflow. I want to jump in here and say, that's such a tremendous exercise because this is what I had to learn is you can write down what you think you are but it really doesn't matter until you see what others write for you. Yeah. And, and there's a, a point you have to own that. And, and yeah. now you can say, hey, I don't want that. I, those two lists are different, but you have to own how others see you. And, yeah. and you can't make those lists the same until you own how others see you and say, yes. oh, I don't want to be seen that way. I don't want to be seen as this hard, callous, intense things that you've heard me talk about. I had to walk through. I want them to see me as, as fun and energetic and encouraging and, and passionate. And, you know, with a harness on my intensity that helps people rather than dividing people. And those are things yeah. that, that we talked about. Go ahead. No. So I also want to say, so I was lucky enough to play for Bill Belichick as well. Right. So one of the most winningest college coaches in all of college football, um, for his time period, Pete Carroll and also Bill Belichick. So I played for the Patriots and what's the difference between Bill Belichick and Pete Carroll? The answer is simple. It's they, they both get to where they want to go. They just go there differently. And Bill Belichick several times during my tenure there, he said, guys, I understand it sucks to play for me. <laughs> I understand that it sucks, but we win. That's the thing that I want to do is that I want to win. So to your point, when you're saying, you know, sometimes when what we, what we want to portray or what we want to give off, it might not rub people culturally the quote unquote right way, but you, you ultimately get the job done. You get to the ultimate place that you want to go. So now you have to understand that, is it worth what we have to go through in order to get mm -hmm. it? Where with Pete Carroll, like, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's worth you know, competing at every single thing that you do, whether it's a practice, whether it's a walkthrough, whether it's working out in the weight room. Um, I remember a time where there was two guys on our team who one guy got his jaw broken because he lost in a Madden football game, video game, right? It was stupid. It was like over like $5, but we were so competitive. Now he's okay. And he, he's all right. But you know, like brothers do normally they fight and they argue, but they kiss and make up. But it was it was so enthralled and it was it was worth it, right? Like the the rock paper scissors and those things. The same thing you have to ask yourself on the opposite end of the spectrum with Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots is that is it worth it? Do you really want to host a championship trophy at the end of the year? Well, this is what you're going to have to go through in order to mm -hmm. get it. And so um, so it's one on the leaders. You know, back to your original question, it's one on the leaders. Understand who you are, be transparent, and be extremely. 
um, organic and authentic doing that. But then also for the people who are in the organization, Hey, is this part of the culture that I want to be? Do I, do I, I want this outcome. They get this outcome. Do I want to go through what it takes to get there? You know, is the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? So, I mean, there's this image of me and you're, you're talking the image in my mind of you being in a situation, whether it's there in the Coliseum with coach Carroll and, or whether it's in new England and, and you're training with Belichick. And at some point they lay out, this is what it's going to take. And I'm just imagining the way you describe it. There are guys that are like, no, I'm not, I'm not down for that. I'm not in. And they walk away. And, and you probably saw that. And as you just said, the, I, I would have to imagine those two coaches aren't sitting there saying and worrying about the people that walked away. Rather, they're saying, that's okay. You didn't want to you know, rise to whatever we have set here, but that's okay. I, I, I'm not going to um, – I'm not going to waste my, I don't want to say waste my time on that, but I'm not going to punish everyone else in the organization because someone else decided to walk away. There's just this image of that and how important that is as we're leading an organization. It's like if our vision is to achieve a championship, if our vision is to you know, be the best service provider in our, our sector, this is what it's going to take to get there. And, and if you aren't, if that doesn't align with your mission and your vision, that's okay. You know what? I'd much rather you go somewhere else that you can find where it fits your mission and vision. I'm just guessing you saw that with those two coaches. Yeah, you see it. And, and I, you know, it's one of the things that I love that on the John Gordon team that we talk about is that one, one apple doesn't make a tree, but it can spoil it. Mm, it's yeah. one, one can't make a team, but one can break a team. Right, because of, of the cancers, because of the negativity, because of, of all of the stuff that's communicated and talked about in a negative light. And I did see it. I mean, I was part of it. I had to there was a there was a there was a fork in the road for me going into my second year at USC because I didn't like I wasn't used to competing every single day. I was I was the guy who was used to competing on game day, but not on practice or you know, in the weight room or in the film room or just competing just because. I always needed something else to push me to an environment to push me to, to compete. And so it was a fork in the road. Hey, Thomas, you can get off this train, but you can't stop it. This train mm-hmm. isn't going to stop to make you feel comfortable, to make you feel like you're a part of it. So you can either join and and thank God we had great leaders like Kerry Colbert and, and guys like Sean Cody and Lofa Tutupu and Matt. I mean, I can literally go on and on because we had guys who were like who made it fun and said, look, you can come along and it's easy. The only thing you have to do is show up. And just because of by, and this was the only time in my life that I've seen osmosis really work. It's like you hang around long enough and you're going to catch this bug too. Yeah. And it's like, we had, you know, coaches in the locker room, so to speak, who almost policed us to say, Hey, look, we compete in everything that we do. But if you don't want to be here, just like to your point, don't mess it up for the rest of us. And we're not going to stop you from leaving. We're actually going to encourage you to leave so that you can go find a place that you get excited about because we're excited about winning. We're excited about competing and having fun. And so it's the same thing with, with people in the world today who go to work, who are part of nonprofit organizations, who are part of for-profit organizations that finding the culture that fits your personality or the personality that you wish to be like is extremely important. You know, I, I tell all the times, um, like a lot of my students that I teach who are transitioning into college and we're talking about the transition process, because uh, you got to prepare for your transition while you're still playing um, for when you're done playing. And I talk about, you know, when you go to get interviewed at a job, you're interviewing that company just as much as they're interviewing you because you don't want to lie to have to, to get a job because you're going to have to stay a liar to keep it. And mm. you're going to get angry and upset and, and, and kind okay. of pissed so, off. So wait a second. That was so pivotal that I want you to say it again. Mm. Because I think it's important not from the standpoint of our personal self, but if we create an environment to where people need to do that to be in our organization, then we have a bunch of liars. So I, I want you to state that again. Yeah. you you. If you're going to lie to get a job or to get a position, if you're an employee going to an employer and you're in the interview process, if you're going to lie to get the job, this is what I do well. Yeah, it doesn't bother me to work, you know, late hours or, you know, Monday through Friday, whatever it is. If you lie, they're going to expect you to do that day one through day 10 through, you know, year 20. 
And so if you lie to get it, you have to lie to keep it. And it's right. like anything, right? It's like dating. It's like it's like getting a job. It's it's yeah. if you but you would rather come in and say, Hey guys, this isn't for me. Yeah. And it and and I like that you guys are, are top fifty in the country, top twenty in the world, whatever it is, but this isn't part of my culture. And I think now more than ever, we've had, you know, the past two years to sit at home and really self be you know, self aware and evaluate what is it that works for me? And I love talking with the companies and the organizations and having, this is one thing, another thing I learned from coach Carol, he said, if you can't write down your personal mission in 30 words or less, then you don't know it. Your personal mission of who you are, what you want to represent. And, and you know, this, you can also do this for your business. And so I love asking, you know, the CEOs and the presidents, you know, what does your culture stand for? And, and, and they're like, well, they start, you know, ums and, you know, kind of like, and sort of like, and a little bit of this. And I'm like in 30 words or less, write it down. What is it? What does it stand for? Mm-hmm. And they're like, we don't, we don't know it. And I'm like, well, how do you expect the people who are following you or the people who are working with you or underneath you to, to know it? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's, that all goes back and all ties together. It, it's, you know, when we're pulling together, it's so much easier. But if you don't know which side of the rope you're pulling, then you have no idea how you can be together. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the, you know, the point of that is like, how do you iterate? If, if I'm laying this, if, if Coach Carroll would have just said, oh, there's a rope, I just get at that rope without giving the direction in the mission in the vision and then iterating it, you know, changing it along the way to accomplish this specific goal, it would have never worked. Um, so mm. I, I want to transition. So one of the things that came up and, and one of the, uh, actually the guy who invited me, who then brought you in to head up this conference that we did, uh, his name is Jeff. And I was talking to him afterwards and he goes, Tyler, did you realize that you guys talked about rich leadership? And I said, uh, no, I had no idea. You know, Thomas and I just, you know, put this together. We wanted to make something super fun and engaging. And you had a couple segments, I had a couple segments, and we broke out some different um, um, uh, topics, some mindsets, some, you know, you start off that story, obviously, Pete Carroll. Um, but then we got into, you know, the five R's, the four I's, the four C's, and the three H's. And we had no intention. It wasn't necessarily in that order. And afterwards, like, oh, that was pretty cool. So I'd love to do this, is, and I'm going to read them off because I have them here, um, the, the, the five R's. Uh, I'm going to start the five R's of mindset, which are routine, reset, remember or not, realistic, repeat. And so for Mm. the audience, we're starting there. Um, Take your notes. I'll I'll hit those again. But one of the things that we did is, you know, I presented that and then you kind of discussed it. We led into a breakout group. And so just, you know, it's been a couple weeks since we did it. I know. But as you just heard that list again, in that idea of mindset, what hit you? Man. I would, I would love to say all of them. Yep. You can't I mean, do that. <laughs> I, I mean, you, I, because there's, uh, here's, here's why I okay, say okay, that. Okay. You, you can do that. You, you can do that. As you broke them down in the conference, I mean, say that, say the list again, like for yeah, people for to sure. really understand this. All right. So the five R's of mindset, routine, reset, remember or not realistic and repeat. Mm, and repeat. I think, you know, as as you refresh my memory, the two that sit really close to me is routine and reset routine. So one of the things that I feel like a lot of us in the the professional or personal development space are, are kind of going over and over and over, whether it's with the individual clients or with it, it's with group clients is they're trying to find out what is their routine because they're burnout. I need a routine. I need to get back to who I am. And so when you say, routine and reset. It's reset after each day. I mean, we're coming up on the end of the year. We're coming up on, okay, are we going back to something? Are we going forward to something? Are we in the normal? So I need to reset all of this. And so those two stick out to me the most because for, for me, I think athletically and personally, there was always a routine. I mean, Mm -hmm. you, you have animals, you have, you have Mm -hmm. a farm, there's, there's things, you know, so you probably sleep on the same side of the bed. You, you, Uh you you put your alarm clock in the same place. You, you set it at a specific time. You, you know, which animals you're going to first, like, you know, which, you know, which, which tool you're going to use. Like you just have a routine. It's not like, ah, I'm just going to go out there tomorrow morning, you know, four 30 and 
I'm going to see what I have to do. You know, and it's, it's clockwork, right? And that's what helps you be efficient. That's what you helps you Mm -hmm. be proficient and then also effective at the same time. And then you go throughout your whole day and then you reset and you're going to do that same thing again. And you know, what I loved about the conference is that there was a lot of people on the call. Like I, okay. I know there's something off. I, I don't know how to get it back on track. I don't know how to get it back in alignment. And that's what I loved about your five R's is that, Hey, we're going to get a routine, find out your routine. What is it that you need to do? Whether it's, you know, I see you have your, your coffee or tea and your mug or, or maybe mm-hmm. even water. Like you have your thing that gets you going. I, I remember you talked about, you read books and you listen to your, 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 your audio books or your podcast or, or your sermon or something to get you going. And I feel like that was one of the things that we gave a ginormous breakthrough to a lot of people because we not only said it, we talked about what is it, Tyler, that can help somebody get a new routine so yeah. that they can get to reset and go out throughout their day? What about you? What were, what were some of the ones that, I mean, obviously you came up with five, but that you thought that landed great with, with the group? I think the, the one that really, as I'm thinking now, it's the repeat. It's kind of the reset and say, all right, you know, what worked today? What didn't? And the repeat and and kind of this reset is like, oh, you're going to do it again tomorrow. And and so that process starts over again. And if you're not looking at saying, how can I maximize and create efficiency routine? Let let me talk a little bit about football world. You know this from many years of practices. And, And I know this from sports is there's no downtime. It is every single minute of training, every single minute of your day is identified where it's going to be and maximized for efficiency. And and when we think about that, why is that? Not to just absolutely uh, squash people's personality. It's to limit the amount of thinking so that way you can be most effective when you need to be. And, And I think for a lot of professionals that maybe haven't gone through that, they're like, just give me all the freedom. I want all the freedom. I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. And what's really hard there is your mind is frantic all the time as opposed to I'm going to have a routine. I'm going to reset what needs to be reset. I'm going to remember what I need to remember or just block away that, you know, that bad play that, you know, that uh, seam route where I didn't cover the tight end and he went for a touchdown and we got burnt. I need to forget about it and go back to my training, understand what do I need to do next time? The next time you're not going to get rubbed by the guy coming, you know, from the slant and that you get you know, taken off the plate, but yet the repeat is you have to be repeat and have to be realistic to say, dude, I can't cover this guy. How do I need to make sure if he's coming at me again, that I can move in order that I can do the best that I can. And I think those are all elements that we can, you know, as professionals realize, Oh, some of these structures, some of these ideologies are for my great benefit to maximize my abilities rather than hinder me. Um, yeah. and, and make me less where I'm just a cog in the wheel. It's like, no, it's going to allow your abilities to really play out in their best. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Less, less choice, less decisions that go into it. I mean, I always love to use the analogy of Southwest. You know, so many times we get on a Southwest flight, right? And, and it's great. No, you know, shout out. I've worked with Southwest before and shout out to Southwest. But also understanding when you give people the option to sit wherever they want, it takes a little bit longer to board a flight. But if you know that you're sitting in 17C, you, there's, there's, you take the choice out of it. Right, which means you already know where your bag is going to go if you have a carry-on. You already know where you're sitting. You don't need to look up and say, "Well, do I want this one? Does this one have more leg room? Oh, the shade doesn't work. Oh, the tray table." Like, there's you take all of the thought out of that part of it, and so it's the same thing like what you're talking about with people on a personal, professional side. When you can take the thought out of what you do, it just allevi- alleviates you from you know making the right or the wrong decision. It's just a decision, and then you move forward, and you can be productive. Yeah, awesome. All right, let's transition a little bit. Uh, we're going to be out of order here, but just bear with me. Uh, I'm going to jump to the four C's, okay? Yeah. The four C's that you shared, which are communicate, yep. connect, commit, and care. You want to give a, just a quick rundown what those are, how those apply, and then I'll, I'll share some uh, notes on those. Yeah, man. And, and I love it. And I didn't even think about the five, four, three that you just, that you did at the very beginning of this. And it's like, it's crazy to sit there and think about how much 
gold came from us collaborating and, and bringing our, our full selves to the engagement. So the four C's, like you mentioned, it is communicate, connect, care, and commit. Um, it's what all great teams do. And it doesn't matter if you're an athletic team. It doesn't matter if you're a team that works in an office or cubicles or you're working remotely is that you have to communicate. Remember, uh, and this is a thing that I've learned from John Gordon from, you know, several years back is that when there's a void in communication, negativity fills its place. Mm -hmm. You think about a text message, uh, you think about an email, you think about when there's that awkward silence in a, in a, in a conversation that's verbal and you can see face to face. Uh, when there's a void in communication, negativity always fills its place. So that's why in sports, I used to love this thing where it was sign cosine is that I would say, Hey, I got left, left, left. And the person who I was communicating that to would always repeat it back. So they would cosign left, left, left. And now I'm just using that just for, for the yeah. sake of the argument. And so what we do in, in sports, we don't necessarily always do in the relationship with our partner. We don't always do in the relationship with, with the teammate or a coworker. We just assume that they heard it or they assume that we acknowledged it. And so when we, we don't do that properly, then there's that void and then there's that break in communication. But then you ask the question of why do you communicate? We communicate so we can connect. What is a connection? Is that when we can connect and we know who, who the other person is on the other side of this call, on the other side of the computer, um, or even who's working right next to me at the desk. You know, one of the things we found out during the pandemic is that we work with people, but we have no idea who we're working with. It doesn't matter if it's been three months. It doesn't matter if it's been 30 years. We, I didn't know that Tyler lived on a farm. I didn't know that he, he, you know, has, has three beautiful children. I didn't know that he was from, you know, the Midwest. I didn't know he grew up a, a, a Buckeye fan. Um, but what we're finding out now is that now we're able to connect because we're forced to communicate more. We're, we're, we're on these Zoom calls all the time. We're picking up the phone. We're, we're channeling and, and connecting and communicating more than ever. Um, and that puts us into our third C, which is commit, or I'm sorry, um, care. And so we people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so really caring about who you're working next to, who you're working beside. Um, and then once you get that buy-in, then you get commitment. And I always tell the story about how Ronnie Lott, uh, you know, hurt his finger and he was told that, you know, if you, if you have surgery on your finger, then you're not going to be able to play in the playoffs. And this is when he was playing for the 49ers and they were having all those great championship runs. And he looked at the doctor and he was like, well, what about if I just cut it off? And they're like, well, if you cut it off, you don't have to do any rehab. Like you don't have to miss any games. He's like, cool this I'll be ready in 15 minutes. And so I always joke with people and say, which hand left or right? Are you, are you, are you really committed? Um, but we, we, we have to understand those four C's and you can break down any relationship formed, um, whether it's personal, professional. And if you, you see a breakdown in your relationship, it's usually because of one of those four things. Yeah. And when we can have more of them and be very intentional with the four C's, um, then it gives us a chance to be successful and then also understanding the collaboration in the partnership. So uh, a way for me to summarize, and I think those four C's are actions that we can um, partake in and encourage others that display and um, really create empathy. You know, when we choose to communicate, when, when you say, like you shared, Hey, left side, left side. And the, you know, the other, uh, the, the, the will backer says, Hey, left side, left side. Then all of a sudden you, you guys are communicating. There's a care, there's an empathy, like we're in this together. And, and I think that's where that communication, the idea of care committing to it. And none of that matters if we're not willing to connect mm. and I think that's, again, the, the four C's are actions to really display and, and really, you know, engage in empathy. Yeah. My definition is empathy is putting your arm uh, around someone and walking with them. And if I take that right now, if I put my arm around someone, I care about them. If I put my arm around someone, I want to connect with them. If I put my arm around someone, I'm committed to them. And you can't put your arm around someone 
without communicating with them. Yeah. And, and I think that's what really, you know, hit me as, as a virtue of leadership. It's like, man, if you're not practicing those four C's with anyone that you're leading or in relationship with, then you're not being empathetic. And there's absolutely no way no. that you can possibly lead them. No, no. And I love, and I love what you're, you're saying, you know, because when you did mention that, you're like putting your arm around someone. And right now, that's all we want. That's all we want. Does, yeah. does Tyler care? Does Tyler, you know, we've had endless conversations. I mean, the way that you communicated with Jeff and Nathan and then the other people on the HDI call, it was, I'm here with you. I want, let me put my arm around you. So if we need to stop here because you're not understanding something or maybe you want to input something here a little bit more, it was so beautifully done. And that's why we had the engagement that we had because people felt like you cared. Mm -hmm. And that's in any organization, top down leader, anyone who cares. I'll never forget the time when, when Pete Carroll came up to me and I didn't know if I was going to red shirt. And again, I'm 18 year old freshman and I have no input on whether we win a game or not. And so I don't know if I'm a red shirt. I'm a little bit uncertain and uncertain. Um, and I just go, Hey, coach, uh, would love to talk to you tonight after practice on my future. And he's like, great, come by the office. And, you know, like a lot of times things happen and you don't, you know, follow through with your word. The next morning at breakfast, he came up to me and goes, hey, I was in my office last night. You never came by. I knew at that moment, Coach Carroll cared about me. In that moment at 18 years old, because he remembered enough. And again, I'm a squat, squatty 18 year old freshman, not going to play, have no implications on this year's season, but he thought about it enough that there was something in it. He goes, Hey, let me ask this kid, what, how's he doing? What does he mm -hmm. need from me in this moment? He's my player. I told him I'm going to care about him. I told his mom, I protect him. I got his back the whole nine. But how many times do we have those chances and those opportunities, whether it's with our families, whether it's with our team, um, and we remind them. Hey, there was, you know, there was something you said you needed my eyes on next set eyes. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Not just in the moment, yeah. but what do we have to do? We have to be present. I, you know, as you shared that story and I think, you know, there's that part of grace is important there it is to know that, you know, it, you didn't share why that you didn't go to that meeting. You shared obviously that that memory is in, ingrained in your head of that experience of how coach Carol reacted and he had grace on you. He didn't come to you and just say, hey, you blew me off, so we're done. Like, you know, go find a new team, whatever else. And, and he could have in, in a way, right? And, and there's coaches that do do that. But he really showed that he did care. And there was that grace in the moment to say, hey, he's an 18-year-old kid. If I show him care, man, that's going to unlock so much more rather than me getting in his face and – you know, chastising him because maybe that isn't what he needs. He just needs me to care right now. Mm. So, um, I love that. Um, let's jump ahead to the four eyes. Okay. So mm. I, I shared this at the event. I came up with this the night before. Uh, it was amazing me to me how well it's played out. Uh, I've shared it with, uh, future podcast guests. and They're like, wow, that's pretty cool. I, I don't, it just came to me. It's not something I can, I can collect other than a, a higher spirit is where it came from. And so what I identified is the four barriers of leadership. And uh, so I'm going to read through them, give a, a quick little context, and then I'd, I'd love to get your feedback. So they happen to all start with I. So the four I's, the barriers of leadership, and they are insecurity, insensitivity, inactivity, and intensity. And, you know, as I shared those, it, it was pretty amazing as we went into breakout groups and we discussed it and, and people were saying, oh, you know, okay, yeah, I can see the insensitivity and, and I can see the inactivity, how that plays out where, you know, I, I choose not to engage. Uh, I choose not to, um, you know, make that extra call. I choose not to have that conversation with someone, but then there is, you know, the, the intensity. And that was the one that caught people by surprise. And it was probably my biggest barrier over time is that my intensity pushed people away. And, and as we discussed that along with the insecurity is like, I'm just not sure what value I have here. I don't know where my worth is. To me, all four of them connect, all three of them, excuse me, all connect to insecurity, but they're displayed in different ways. And it is this, this barrier, I believe, if we go back to your four C's, those one of those represents the biggest barrier that we have 
in being able to actively lead and be a leader that our organization, our world, our family needs. And it was fun to me to, to see how that resonated with people. But also this idea is some of them said, I never thought that intensity could be a barrier in leadership. And it, it really was a, a fun experience to, to hear the feedback from people. Man, you nailed it. I mean, it was funny talking with you and you're like, hey, I'm going to switch it up and I think I'm going to go with these eyes. And as you were reading the eyes, I was like, yeah, I think insecurity probably would be the one of the biggest ones. And then as you kind of rolled out the um, intensity piece and then you shared your own personal story with it, one of the things that I loved is that there were people on the on the call who said – they were the intense one, but they also experienced a leader who was intense, which made them feel a little bit taken back. I can't come to the leader with you know either a problem or even maybe even a question. And, and it reminds me of how many times does a leader ask, does everybody got it on a call? And there's somebody on the call who doesn't get it, but they don't speak up. Why? Uh -huh. Because there's either the leader's intense or the environment of the group is too intense for them to be vulnerable, right? So then now mm -hmm. I can't show my insecurities as somebody who's in the group. And like, I was like, you nailed it. I mean, I think that was the greatest part where because you pull back some layers for people to expose them to some of the things that they knew about themselves. Hey, this is still pricking you. So you got to, you, you might want to pay attention to this. And then it was, Here's something that you don't know. It's like the the don't know what you don't know type thing. Mm -hmm. And this was yeah. the don't know what you don't know. And so that was just beautifully articulated because when people got in there and rolled up their sleeves and said, I've, I've been intense. What what made you – what do you think for you has, has, has been the intense moments that has been a barrier for your leadership? Oh, I mean I, I, it's my it's my personality. It is, I want to get done. I want to move. I want to push. I want to go. And part of that was, you know, as I shared with you and shared with the event, that was how I dealt with some trauma in my life. I, I've shared that with podcasts before, guests before. Um, and, and I think that became just a, how I operated. It's like, because I can feed into it with my personality. It's like, I enjoy being intense. I'd much rather be intense than just kind of Ho hum, move along, move along. It's like I find a situation. And it's kind of like the ball's not moving. It's kind of like give me that darn ball. We're going to move it. Let's go because I don't want to just sit here and stand still. And sometimes that's out of I don't want to say an insecurity or fear. If I stand here and sit still, am I going to be able to um, have value? Or if if we just allow things to marinate, which sometimes is good. Like, just, just let this play out. It's, I, I'm going to think about, you shared, because uh, I think this is, is a good tie-in, uh, that your roommate at USC was, was Reggie Bush. Yeah. And, and I was thinking about this last night. I was watching football. And the difference between the great running backs are the running backs that know when to go all out and when to just hesitate and allow things in front of them to play out, to allow those blocks to just develop. It, it's the, the difference in the salesperson that goes to make the sales call and they push it and say, I need this sale done today, as opposed to, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a pushback here. Well, let me just let this thing just kind of just settle out on its own. I'm still going to be here. I'm going to know when to follow up. I'm going to know how to follow up and I don't need to be so intense that I have to get this deal done today because ultimately, and I think this comes back to the, the comment that you made earlier is if you are lying in the beginning, you got to keep lying the whole time. And, and I think when, when that's done in say a leadership or a business and you're so intense, well, the only way to maintain that result is to be so intense but that's exhausting. That's exhausting from an emotional point of view. That's exhausting from a physical point of view. And when people get exhausted, they look for the door. Yeah. And it just happens to be where I'm pointing is, is the door in my office. But they start looking for the door. And I think that's what was, was shared and you kind of iterated this idea of this intensity. It's okay for a little while. And then all of a sudden people start looking for the door because they're yeah. like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm yeah. like, I, I, I can't handle this anymore. It's just, yeah. it's too much. Right, right. Now, man, that's just a, such a beautiful illustration. And I feel like 
Well, let me ask you this question. So now you're aware of it or you've been aware of it. What has um, settled your intensity or has it been settled? Um, because there's, I feel like this point in making, now that we've given people the, the, the window or we pulled the curtain mm -hmm. back of this for them, how can we help them with this? Uh, what's worked for you and, and what's something that, that you would prescribe if you were, were a doctor with the eyes? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to your four C's. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's learning that that empathy. Uh, I used to describe it this way, and it, it's such a for people that get it, they get it. But it, it, it sounds very bad. Is I had to learn how to be lazy, mm. and, and that that sounds like what? And and for the people that I've discussed that with, they're like, oh, I get it. But it, it, it's not a good way to um, really describe and. And, and really lay out the practice. It is. It's choosing to communicate. It's choosing to connect. It's being committed. It's caring with people. It, it's doing that. It's to me. It's being empathetic. It's putting your arm around people, because when you're put your arm around people and you're intense, you have to slow to their pace and walk. Mm. Now you can still walk with them. You can still lead them. You can still move together. It's not putting your feet in the ground and just stopping. It's still going the process. But if you're not walking with them at a pace, they're willing to walk, mm -hmm. then you're not going anywhere. Yeah. And, and I think that is, you know, for me, it, it's learned. I had to slow down to go faster. I had to slow down to be able to go with people to say, Hey, we're going to accomplish something bigger. It, it is really the, the African proverb. You know, one goes fast, many go far. Yeah. Well, you can go fast and far, but you're going fast together at the rate the everyone else can go. And it, yep. it sometimes means that you have to start going back to, you know, the teams that you are a part of is you have to find people that their normal walking pace is your normal walking pace. Yeah. And once you do that, you can go as fast as you want. Yeah. If it's when you, when people have different paces and then all of a sudden you're you're trying to figure this out and this can happen in a lot of organizations like do we find the pace that works for people and do we allow them to get off the train when the pace is too fast for them mm -hmm. and saying you know what I, I need you to get off the train um, because you're better suited on a different train and that's okay you know right. I want to go on the high speed bullet you're looking at riding the polar express yeah. that's cool go for it that's right there's a place for it but it's it's understanding which that is and to me that is empathy and it's it's putting a harness on that intensity yep yeah and i think a leader needs to have that understanding in my mind right now it's like i see i see either a trainer who's getting someone else in shape like maybe a client or maybe a friend and maybe they're starting out on their fitness journey and so the trainer is, is the triathlete, right? Swims, runs, bikes, does the whole thing. But this person is just day one of their journey. And so the, the trainer can't say, hey, today we're going to run 26.2 miles, swim 2.4, and bike 112 on the first day. First day is like, I mean, we're going to walk around the block. Um, we're going to, you know, do five push-ups and do 10 sit-ups. And that's day one. But what I noticed for me, because I was also the intense one, or I should say I still am and working on it. <laughs> and I'm learning now that eventually we'll get there to where, yeah. quote unquote, I am. Yeah. Um, but I need to come to, to, not down, but I need to come to where the other person is. And mm -hmm. I need to go on them with that journey because I also yeah. don't want them to go too fast, too soon because I want to go far. I don't want to quit. Mm -hmm. I want to go, I, I want to go far and I want yeah. them to go far with me and I want to go far with them. And so bringing them along, you know, like what Jay-Z says is that what you do, what you eat doesn't make me go to the bathroom, but he uses other words. And, and so <laughs> what, what, what I understand is that because we can't go as fast right here, right now with that person it doesn't take away. I can do my own intense thing when I want to. I can wake up in the morning at, at mm -hmm. two forty five and and play my ACDC and you know, drink my pre workout and, and do that. But when we get together, that might not be the radio station that everyone's playing. Mm -hmm. So yep. listen to my radio station with me and with the other people who also like to listen to that station, who who they are the intense ones. But then also understand that hey, we're going to sit around, drink egg, eggnog, uh, eggnog and, and listen to, to Christmas music, right? Yeah. And we're going to hang up, hang up ornaments. We're going to chill. 
Yeah. Um, but I think that's that's been one of the biggest things because it's not an either or; it's and both. I think you know to to just camp out a little bit longer as you share that. One of the things I realized is how uncomfortable my intensity made people. And it was simply, it, it became the way that I operated. Mm. And, and I had to be willing, as you just shared there, to care enough about others to not force them to listen to my radio station. And there's a time and place for that. I can go listen to the ACDC with people, but there may be times that I need to go listen to Michael Buble. And, and that's okay. I may not enjoy it. And that may not be my gig, but yet if I come into the room and I, you know, am the bull in the China shop, which one of the things that you and I shared, and I think this is, this is something that's dear to my heart is, you know, I can with my intensity and, and, and my, you know, look sometimes be that bull in a China shop, especially by Enneagram eight. And I have to understand that sometimes does way more harm than good. But yeah, there's a place for it. I just have to understand where that place is. And that's learning how to gauge and manage that intensity. Mm. And, and it's still something I actively have to work with within my family probably the most now. Yeah, is, great, you know, great when practice. I get intense within my family. And my wife even mentioned it yesterday. She's like, we're not sure when you're going to just kind of – my daughter was sharing something about she didn't want to do something because, like, I don't know if you're going to yell. And I'm like, well, just do it. Like, yeah, just, just get it done. But yeah. Um, and, and it's having to learn that. So yeah. Yeah. Great learning. Great learning. And this is, this yes. is gold. This is gold for people because you know, the thing that I love about your podcast is that it speaks to the person holistically as opposed to in just one sector and area. Um, and this is going to help some people out personally, mm -hmm. which will then carry over into their professional lives. Yep. All right. Let's finish up the yeah. three H's. Um, let me read those off. Hero, hardship, highlight. Uh, it was kind of this amazing little cap that you put on the day and event in kind of very reflective way. So I'd love for you to kind of go through that a little bit more um, for the audience. Yeah, it's uh, and, and it's not mine. It's, it's definitely from The Power of Positive Leadership, which was written by John Gordon um, in the trainings and, and some of the workshops that we do. And it's, it's how do you connect – uh, on a faster pace and, and how do you connect? Because everyone doesn't always necessarily want to connect at the same rate. You know, uh, we are conversationalists, right? Tell me your biggest fears. Tell me what you're working on. Tell me what your, you know, one of your biggest childhood successes are, or maybe one of failures or, you know, moments that you're not most proud of. That can be a little, we can go back to the word intensity. That can be a little <laughs> intense, right? For someone who you're just meeting, uh, or even people who you've known for a long time. And again, diff depending on our personalities, uh, we just have different ways of, of kind of, you know, pulling back some of the layers and, and, and diving in. And so what I love about John's program is, uh, again, from the power of positive leadership, is that there's a way to connect. And it's called Hero Hardship Highlight, the three H's or Triple H, whatever you want to say. And we, we, we have all of them. Right. And and when you're sitting in a room or now we're in a we're virtual breakout rooms and you say, hey, talk to me about your hero, your hardship and a highlight in your life. And it gives you the opportunity to go as deep as you want, because we all have uh, a surface answer and we all have, you know, kind of the ocean's deep answer of of, you know, who's your hero? What's a hardship and, and a highlight of your life? And I just love how quickly. And those three simple things, we can connect because a hero could be a family member. It could be a coach or a teacher, uh, a distant relative. It could be somebody who we watched on TV because we didn't necessarily have a great example of who a hero is, right? Like I've heard answers, everything from a family member, you know, mom or dad to an aunt and uncle, coach, teacher, or even like, you know, Spider-Man. Somebody who they never met, and and that was their hero growing up because that was somebody who showed them how to overcome adversities or, or you know superpowers or whatever it is, and then a, a hardship. You know what's a hardship that you've gone through? And again, the reason why I love it is because it talks to, you know, on your scale from one to ten, what's something hard that you've gone through? Um, and obviously, it was difficult for you at the time, but you made it out because you're here to tell about it. And so mm -hmm. that just gives us, you know, when we can connect on a hardship level, it, it, it brings us together because it goes, wow, either me too, like I've gone through something like that, or I know someone who's gone through something like that. So I know how hard that was. 
Um, and it gives, you know, like what you talk about with this, which is empathy, but it also talks to how, how hard have you had it? I sit there and see Tyler, who's just this, you know, looks great and, and, and has a beautiful shiny bald head, you know, this great infectious <laughs> smile and just this guy who has it going on because he has a beautiful family and life and et cetera. And he goes, oh, wow, you, you don't have a silver spoon. You've gone through some stuff in your life. Holy cow. All right, that's that's good enough in evidence and advice that that I can make it through whatever I either just went through or that I'm going to go through. Um, and the last one, which is which is highlight, you know, talk to me about something that's gonna that's gonna put a smile on your face by talking about it, and also gonna put a, a smile on my face because I hear it, you know. And that's the one thing of 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 life is that what's a what's a hero who's somebody who you looked up to? What's a hardship? Maybe your lowest time or a low time, and now bring me back up on a high. So where, where somebody goes a highlight and they start to talk about, you know, their kids or, or, you know, being the first person in their family graduate college or the job that they have, or, you know, going from living in a, in their car to, you know, owning their home or whatever it is. And you see their body language just shift and then change. And it allows us to connect on a deeper level as opposed to, Hey, did you get the P and L from last quarter? Yeah. Okay. What do we need to do with the expense report? And then you go, Whoa, there's a person inside of the employee. There's a mm -hmm. person. And the best piece of advice I ever got was from Ken Norton Jr., who coached uh, me and, and a lot of guys in college, is coach the person first and the player follows. And most people just coach the player or in, in a corporate setting, they just speak to the employee. They don't speak to the person. And when you do that, then there's a block. And you mm -hmm. can only go so far with the player or with the employee. But there's there's an in-depth perception and, and point with the person, and, and the person has a heart. The employee, the player, maybe not so much, but the person always has a heart. And when you can speak to the heart of somebody, then they'll go that much further. They'll always push, you know, eh, 89% coasting, or can I kick it into 90%? And so mm -hmm. through the through the Triple H exercise, as we saw, there's a lot of people who connected, um, but also thought a little bit differently than they would normally think to to think about on on something like that. Yeah, I mean, what what I love about the three H's is it it is an action steps to take to go back to those four C's uh, of learning that connect and then you know going through that process and you know as you share this about you know. Um, as Ken Norton was your, was your coach, junior was your coach. I, I can imagine there's a point to where you can tell the difference between a coach bringing out the best of a person as opposed to being the player. The moment he no longer refers to you by your number, right? Instead of being, Hey, 47, Hey, 45, Hey, 22, he comes up and says, Hey, Reggie, Hey, uh, you know, Thomas, Hey, you know, uh, whatever name it is, yeah. all of a sudden it, it's totally different. You're like, Oh, I'm no longer that number. Yeah. And when I think about that organizationally, we're no longer that position, that person in a position, they start to care about, Oh, I, you're a person here that's making all this happen, but it's only because you're a person here. Yeah. And that's what I love about doing the Triple H exercise is that inside all of these organizations, now you find out about, oh, I didn't I didn't know Tyler a hardship was, you know, going from living in France, you know, K through eight and then coming over to the United States. I moved from Puerto Rico and I had to make new friends. Like so now mm -hmm. we're connected. We have something else that bonds us as opposed to a business card which yep. can change at any moment or we park totally. next to each other in the parking lot. There's, there's that connection, which again, to the person, as opposed to just uh, the employee in the position that, that you, that you might do. All right. So I want to share this for everyone listening in all of those, all uh, if I get my numbers right, 16 of those items will be listed in the show notes. Um, it, it was a lot of fun to go through it and see it afterwards, how it, you know, kind of laid out as we discussed. But I want to hear your final thoughts, your final thoughts on this, your final thoughts on, on kind of this idea of 2022 and, and our leadership opportunity moving forward. Um, what do you got for me? Man, one of the things I feel like is I was reading recently and it was like the old uh, Chinese bamboo tree. And um, one of the things I, I feel like it's the correlation between the bamboo tree and where we are right now is that. In the process, every single day you gotta you gotta till the soil, you gotta water it, you gotta you gotta nurture it, 
um, and it doesn't grow for the first four years as you plant this seed. And then in like the fifth year, it grows in the first three months, it grows uh, 60 to 90 feet. And the question is always, you know, did the tree grow in the fifth year in those three months or did it grow in the first four years when nothing was happening? And obviously you and I know that it's, it's in the four years. But the thing about it is if you miss a day or you miss a week in doing what you're supposed to do, then the process stops. You have to start all over again. And I feel like right now we're in this process of trying to wait that we're going to start moving when we see the tree grow. We're going to start moving mm -hmm. when we see like, oh, it's poking through the ground. Oh, it's growing 60 to 90 feet. But the, the, the reality of the situation is that nothing happens until you do. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens until you do. And so I really want to encourage people, and I think that's what we got from the rich leadership, is that it all starts with you. Leadership is an inside-out job. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to start being a better leader when this happens. I'm going to start, you know, devoting a little bit more time to my team when this happens. It's I'm going to start devoting time to my team because I want this to happen. I'm going to start devoting more time and more energy and more focus to my family because I want this to happen. Or I'm going to dedicate more time to myself because I want this to happen. And so just like the bamboo tree and just like who we are um, as part of our, our responsibility on this earth is that continue to act in the way that you want for the results and for the outcomes um, and not because of the current circumstance. Hmm. That is so much, so much goodness in that, that I would take another 20 minutes if we continued to talk about it. And I don't know if we're not doing the Joe Rogan podcast here, so I'm not going to keep you for three hours. Um, but dude, thanks so much. Thanks so much yeah. for sharing. Thanks so much for this opportunity. I love everything you shared. Uh, I am imagining and knowing that the audience is going to get so much from it. So thanks, dude. I appreciate it. You're awesome, man. And I mean, just I, if I could have just a, a, a tidbit of, you know, kind of the last impromptu change in events that could come out in his gold, like you had with the eyes, bro, that is, that's amazing. So continue to lead with your heart and your gift, uh, and to be directed and guided by the spirit. I, I will share this. Uh, it's not me. It's God. So, yes. Uh, I have no problem sharing that. Thanks so much, dude. One last thing is if people want to learn more about Thomas, it'll be in the show notes. Yeah. But where can they find out about Thomas Williams? Um, they can. I'm not on social media. So I've been off of social media for two years today. Um, which has been amazing and great. Um, I mean, I guess maybe check out the next podcast that I'm going to be on, you know, continue to, 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 you know, listen to this, but they can't, I guess I'll just be coming to them to, to, a, you know, a, a podcast or an event near, yeah. near them, but I'm, I'm pretty much the, the guy you never hear about. And yeah, and but you have a website. Topics. So <laughs> I have a website, which is website. Yes. Thomas R. Williams uh, but yeah, to find out more information yeah. there. All right, dude. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, man.